Target sabe que tú siempre encuentras el motivo para juntar a toda la familia. Cada platillo está hecho con amor. Y todos los bailes son una celebración que te conectan con tus antepasados. Cada instante es más de lo que parece. Encuentra todo para hacer cualquier momento aún más grande con Target. Más que un momento. Construyamos el futuro juntos. Visita target.com diagonal más que para apoyar las marcas que son de y para nosotros. Did you know 77% of women who wear bladder weakness products experience intimate skin irritation? As if having incontinence wasn't stressful enough. But Tenna Intimate Pads have been gynecologist tested and do not cause skin irritation. Gentle on my intimate skin. I need to try Tenna Intimate Pads. Visit tenasample.com for your free sample. Kind to skin protects like Tenna. Hello, and welcome to Campus Crime Chronicles. I'm your host, Nicole Turner, former college professor, current college administrator, but always a true crime addict. In every episode of this podcast, I take a deep dive into some sort of true crime that occurred on a school campus or is associated with a college or university in some way. For each episode, I rate the seriousness of the crime from one to five on my very own serious crime scale, with one being completely not serious, possibly even a little humorous from time to time, to five being very serious. This episode is rated a five. It's probably a story unlike anything you've heard before when it comes to colleges and universities, partly regarding campus housing because it's about a family, yes, a whole family, who lived in an apartment on a small college campus in the state of New York. But it's also unlike anything I've covered so far on the podcast because it's just one of those heart-wrenching stories. So just a fair warning, it's going to be hard for you, the listeners, to hear as well. So just a heads up to brace yourself. This episode is titled A Mother's Breaking Point. So without further ado, let's get started. This story takes place at Manhattanville College in Purchase, New York. Since I'm not familiar with the state of New York, like, at all, I had to do some Google searching for a little more context. According to Google Maps, Purchase is actually a very affluent community in the town village of Harrison, New York, which is about 26 to 30 miles outside of Manhattan in New York City. So it shouldn't surprise you that Manhattanville College is a small private liberal arts school with a population of about 3,000 students. This story is about the tragic death of Marissa Ann Pagley, an 18-year-old freshman at the college. According to her obituary, Marissa played volleyball for Manhattanville College and was a member of the Castle Scholars Program. Previously, Marissa graduated from Harrison High School in 2008, and while in high school, she was a member of the band's Color Guard, the National Honor Society, and she played volleyball in high school as well. According to the New York Times, Marissa had grown up on the Manhattanville College campus, as in she and her family lived in staff housing. You see, Marissa's dad, John Pagley, worked at the college as a maintenance supervisor. So he and his wife, Stacy Pagley, raised Marissa and their youngest daughter, three-year-old Gianna, on the campus. So, to be clear, John Pagley worked at the college, and Marissa, now that she was 18 and graduated high school, she started attending the college as well. On the afternoon of February 22nd, 2010, John Pagley came home for lunch and arrived to his family's apartment around 12.15 p.m. The New York Times reported that upon his arrival, John discovered a horrifying scene. He found Marissa lying on her bed, not breathing, and his wife was also unconscious in their home. John immediately called 911 around 12.20 p.m. that day. When paramedics arrived a few minutes later, most sources say that the members of the Harrison Police Department and paramedics attempted to revive Marissa, but they were unsuccessful. 
They were, however, able to revive Marissa's mother, Stacy, and take her to a local hospital. According to one source, though, so I'm not 100% sure of its 100% accuracy, since it only came from that one source, but that particular source was an article originally published on LOHA.com, which is a division of the USA Today network. So, according to the LOHA.com article, paramedics were successful in reviving Marissa as well, but the article stated she later died at the hospital. So regardless of whether that part of the story was accurate or not, um, in this case, Marissa, the daughter, died, but Stacy, her mother, survived. Two days later, while Stacy was still in the hospital, police arrested her and charged her with second-degree murder of her own daughter. You see, after interviewing Stacy Pagley, investigators soon discovered that they had an open and shut case because Stacy not only admitted to killing her daughter, but she also told them exactly how and why it happened. According to a press release from the Westchester County District Attorney, on the morning of February 22, 2010, Stacy Pagley dropped off her three-year-old daughter, Gianna, at daycare. The Loha.com article reported that when she arrived back home after dropping off Gianna, Stacy then took the family's dogs for a walk. But by the time she got back from the walk, Stacy returned to find Marissa getting dressed for class, and the two of them immediately started arguing. Police estimated that this all started shortly before 9 a.m. that day, and the Westchester County press release stated that the argument soon became physical. Stacy told investigators that she entered Marissa's bedroom during their argument after her daughter said something disrespectful. According to NBC News, Stacy asked her daughter where she was going, and when she replied to her mom, whatever she said, it set Stacy off. Stacy told Marissa, quote, don't ever speak to me like that. This will be the last time you speak to me like that, end quote. Then both Stacy and Marissa got into a physical altercation that ended with both of them on the floor. Stacy described the exact moment that she took Marissa's life. And I have to warn you, it is very sad and very hard to hear. So if you don't think you can handle it, I completely understand. And I actually recommend you skipping ahead just about a minute or so into the episode while I explain exactly what happened. So Stacy Pagley told investigators, quote, I had my arms around her neck. She was lying on her stomach at some point. She was also on her back. I was on top of her. Marissa was flailing her arms, end quote. Stacy went on to say that she had Marissa in a chokehold and Marissa put up little struggle because she said, quote, I wouldn't let her, end quote. NBC News reported that Stacy choked Marissa with her hands and she knew immediately after that she had killed her. Police believe Marissa took her last breath at around 9 a.m. on that tragic day. During her interviews with investigators, which only took two separate interviews, by the way, because that is literally how blatantly Stacy spilled her guts, but police asked her if she knew she had done something bad. She said, quote, yes, I killed Marissa, end quote. And when she realized the terrible, terrible thing she had done, Stacy placed her daughter's body onto her bed and put a stuffed teddy bear beside her. When police asked her why she did this, she simply replied, quote, cause I love Marissa, end quote. Then after killing her own daughter, Stacy attempted to slash her left wrist with a kitchen knife, but after that failed, unfortunately, she attempted to use a belt to strangle and hang herself from a doorknob in the home. That last attempt is what rendered her in the unconscious state that her husband found her in. When police prodded Stacy and asked her if she wanted her daughter to die, she said, quote, I wanted both of us to die, end quote. Stacy went on to provide a little more context about the whole tragic situation, which does help to further explain the unfortunate chain of events that led up to Marissa's murder. She told investigators that she and Marissa argued a lot. She said they, quote, argued every day, just like every other day, end quote. And that Marissa always seemed to have a bad attitude toward her mother. I mean, she is a teenager lady, but okay, whatever. Anyway, Stacy said Marissa was disrespectful toward her all the time, but just toward her, she said, not to everyone else. She said, quote, 
she's a different person to everybody else, end quote. Stacy also told investigators that they were always angry with each other, and Marissa routinely called Stacy a bad mother and told her she hated her. So that morning, when Marissa was being disrespectful toward her, Stacy said she reached her boiling point and snapped. She said, quote, I just couldn't live with it anymore. I couldn't take it anymore. She pissed me off for the last time. She couldn't talk to me like that, end quote. When investigators probed her further and asked her if she and Marissa had ever engaged in physical fights before, Stacy said, quote, not really. A couple of little shoves, nothing major like this one. She pushed my last buttons, end quote. Before her suicide attempts, though, Stacy left her husband a goodbye note. Though specific details of that note were not released to the media, sources do provide a general context of what the note said. According to the Loha.com article, Stacy told investigators that she left her husband, John, a note to, quote, relieve John of all the stress that the baggage has brought him, end quote. The note basically said that John could be happy now because she and Marissa were too much for him, too much baggage, and that they ruined his life. Stacy went on to tell investigators that she and John had argued the night before the incident. She stated they had fought, quote, here and there about me being a bitch and some other things he said that I don't ever want to hear or repeat again, things you don't say to your wife if you love her, end quote. I also want to point out that during her interviews with investigators, Stacy called herself a worthless piece of shit. She said, quote, after a while, you just get to know you're fucking worthless. After a while, people tell you the same thing over and over again. You're going to start to believe it and feeling it. And therefore I do, end quote. So she said she didn't mean to hurt Marissa, but all her anger had piled up and exploded. She had reached her breaking point. So I'm guessing by now you can probably tell that, well, Stacy is not and was not mentally well. Is that an excuse for murdering her own daughter? Absolutely freaking not. But it is, unfortunately, a critical factor in this dreadful, terrible tragedy. According to several sources, including that press release issued by the Westchester County DA, four different psychiatric experts for both the defense and the prosecution unanimously agreed that at the time the crime was committed, Stacy was suffering from an extreme emotional disturbance. Her defense attorney, Alan Focarile, said, quote, The fight exploded a bomb that had been growing for some time to which she was oblivious. She was sick and didn't know how to ask for help, end quote. So, because of the results from her psychiatric evaluations, the Westchester County press release stated that her charges were reduced to manslaughter and Stacy entered a plea of guilty to one count of manslaughter in the first degree, a class B felony. It's also critical to note that while Stacy was in custody, in jail awaiting her sentencing, she attempted suicide a third time by tying socks around her neck. That too, however, was a failed attempt. Have you ever wondered what you would get if HGTV and Investigation Discovery had a baby? Well, the long and short of it is, you would get us. Hi, I'm Christina. And I'm Kristen. And each week on The Real Crime Podcast, we bring you a taste of the sinister side of real estate. Tune in each Wednesday for a new episode wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and be sure to subscribe or follow so you don't miss a grisly tale of how dark homeownership can get. On April 11, 2011, so just a little over a year from when the murder occurred, Stacy was sentenced to 20 years in prison and she was issued a no contact order for her youngest daughter, Gianna, who was then four at the time. Stacy was 38 years old at the time of her sentencing. According to an article on Reuters.com, Stacy Pagley sat expressionless at her sentencing hearing. John Pagley, on the other hand, sobbed in court and told Supreme Court Justice Richard Malaya, quote, To this day, I am still learning how many people this senseless crime has affected. Now I am forced to live with a broken heart that is beyond repair, end quote. 
Then John referred to his surviving daughter, Gianna, saying, quote, This child hasn't even begun to understand what her mother has done. I dread the day I have to sit down and explain it to her. End quote. According to the Reuters.com article, as her husband spoke, Stacy looked straight ahead, betraying no emotions. Apparently, she declined to speak at all during the proceedings. But State Supreme Court Judge Richard Malaya said he was struck by the magnitude of the tragedy. The judge said, quote, There is no word for a parent who loses a child. That's how tragic a loss it is. End quote. Reuters.com also reported that Stacy's father, brother, and several other of her relatives all died by suicide. Though I'm not on Stacy's side at all, and there are no excuses for anything she did, I do want to say how incredibly alarming it is when mental illness goes undetected or undiagnosed. It festers, similar to an untreated physical abrasion. If it's not treated, it will get worse and potentially cause irreparable damage. No, I'm not saying that if she would have sought treatment or been diagnosed with a mental illness prior to the murder, that none of it would have happened. But I am saying there would have been a significantly less chance that her psychotic break would have manifested itself in the way it did. So mental health is important, and I will continue to say that until my last breath. Okay, so off my soapbox now. <laughs> With all that being said, Stacey Pagley did express regret. According to NBC News, during one of her court hearings, Stacey said, quote, I wish I could take it back, but I can't. I can't make it better. She's not here anymore. End quote. NBC New York reported that she asked officers to tell her husband and surviving daughter that she does love them and that she is sorry for what she had done. She said, quote, tell Gianna that I love her, that I'm sorry didn't mean to hurt them. Please let John and Gianna know that I did love them. Tell them if I could take it back, I would, but I can't. I'm sorry. End quote. The New York Post reported that John Pagley refused to meet with Stacy's defense team during the court proceedings leading up to Stacy's sentencing, and he did not help his wife at all in fighting the charges. And I can't say I blame him for any of that, one bit. I mean, I can't imagine what he was going through. Just the heartache and pain and betrayal. To me, it's just so unfathomable, like a scene straight out of a Lifetime movie. But in John and his family's world, it was very real and very true. So I don't blame him one minute for distancing himself from his wife and not supporting her in any way. Frankly, I wouldn't blame him if he wanted to kill Stacy himself. But he seems like a strong man who loves his daughters with all his heart. And if he's listening, which I don't think he is, but if he is, I do just want to extend my sincerest condolences for everything he went through and just the terrible losses he experienced. The judge was 100% right. There are literally no words. With that being said, though, I did try to reach out to John Pagley on social media. I had hoped he would maybe talk to me and just help explain this whole tragic situation in a little more detail because honestly, media sources were limited and the articles that I could find were quite vague, just simple, straightforward, open and shut facts. But also, I was hoping he could maybe tell me more about Marissa, you know, the type of young lady she was, her interests and hobbies, her character and personality. But... After two attempts over the past six months, I did not get a response, and I just didn't want to press any further because I really wanted to just respect him. And again, I can't say I blame him for not reaching back out to me or responding to the messages because I'm sure he has just tried to put it all behind him and he's just trying to move on with his life. So anyway, I didn't want to pry any further, but I do want to recognize that he does seem like a wonderful father to Gianna, who is now at least 15. His public social media account is adorned with photos and posts, all bragging about his awesome daughter and her accomplishments. For example, there's a photo of John and Gianna and a cake she baked for him for his 51st birthday. But I guess they share like the same birthday or maybe they're just really close together because 
uh, she turned the letters around like it was a five and a one. I guess the numbers. She turned the numbers around because it was a five and a one. But then she turned the numbers around to be a one and a five for her birthday, too. So they basically shared a cake together. In another post, he said how proud of Gianna he is. And on this particular day of the post, he was commending her for getting a 100 percent on her geometry final. On May 9th, 2021, John posted, quote, Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there, end quote. His post is filled with comments from friends and family saying how wonderful John is. One comment said, Happy Mother's Day to you. You play the role of both mom and dad and you deserve to celebrate that every day. Another comment said to one of the best dad moms I know and then it had a little heart emoji. Then on August 11th of this year, John posted, Happy Heavenly Birthday, sweetheart, as it would have been Marissa's 30th birthday. So it is clear how much John absolutely loves his daughters. And I just really want to say that I, too, think he must be doing a wonderful job of being both a dad and a mom to his daughter, Gianna. Okay, y'all, that was a short episode, I know, but that officially brings us to the end of Chronicle 18. As always, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. If y'all don't review, I won't hit my goal of 50 or more by the end of 2021. Plus, if you love Campus Crime Chronicles and want others to love it too, a review is really one of the only ways to get new listeners. Also, be sure to check out this podcast on social media. I'm at Campus Crime Podcast on Instagram and Campus Crime Chronicles on Facebook. And as always, I will have photos of Marissa and her mother, Stacy, on my social media. So definitely be sure to check those out. Okay, well, that's all for today. So bye for now. Campus Crime Chronicles is researched, written, and recorded by me, Nicole Turner, and it's edited and produced by Big Mad Media. Tune in again in two weeks for the next Chronicle. It was a night like any other. You ate some dinner, chatted with the family. Then, suddenly, you were gone. But they didn't need to worry. You just snuck off for a second to play Best Fiends. Best Fiends is the mobile puzzle adventure game you want to play for hours on end, even when you only have a few moments to spare. From the vibrant artwork and adventure pack storyline to the cute collectible characters and supercharged power-ups, Best Fiends is designed to be the most obsession-worthy game ever. There are literally thousands of levels, plus tons of in-game events added every month for even more ways to win. And the best part is, you can play anytime, anywhere. No Wi-Fi? No problem. Of course, people may start to wonder about your mysterious disappearances until they see how much fun you're having download your new favorite getaway best fiends for free on the app store or google play you'll even get five dollars worth of in-game rewards when you reach level five that's friends without the r best fiends, Play best fiends.